of prayer, and we're going to get into God's Word today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our new church home. And uh, we're just so excited about how you're leading, where you're leading, what you're going to do, Lord. And uh, we pray that you would bless every aspect of this. We pray that everything would be done according to your, your time, your plan, and your will. And now as we turn to your word, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us today, speak to our hearts. We pray that you would use this portion of scripture to challenge us, to change us, to uh, mold us more into your image. And we pray that you would uh, anoint this teaching and the receiving of it uh, in your spirit, Lord, that uh, our hearts will be ready to hear from you. And I thank you for each person here and each person that is watching online. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and turn to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. We'll be looking at the first seven verses. Title of the message today, very simple, The Fall. <clears throat> Adam and Eve, you know, they're now in the garden. And what do they do? They mess up. <laughs> well, as we know, Genesis is a book of beginnings. In the beginning, God. That's how the book starts. In the beginning, God, master, designer of all creation, and all that he created was good. He created a perfect world, placed Adam in a perfect garden, gave him the perfect companion, and together they were to care for the garden that God placed them in. And they were permitted to eat of any tree, any tree of all. Go for it, Adam. Go for it, Eve. You can eat of any tree, all but one. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it's no secret what happened. They did eat of that tree, introducing another new beginning. The beginning of sin and corruption. Well, we won't get into the curse quite yet. Today we focus on the fall and what led to it, why it happened, how it happened, what prompted Eve to eat of that fruit, and what caused Adam to do the same. So let's go ahead and read the passage in its entirety and let's answer some of those questions and many more. Genesis. Chapter 3, beginning of verse 1, it says this. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, what did she do? She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So what we're going to look at today in that passage is, number one, the lie, the lie in verses 1 through 5, then the temptation in verse 6, and then the shame in verse 7. So let's go ahead and pick this apart and uh, let's, let's revisit that first part where it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now the serpent, notice he's not identified here as Satan, but he is identified as the serpent elsewhere in Scripture. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, we read this, The great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And how does he deceive the whole world? Well, we read it here in Genesis chapter 3. He is more cunning than any beast 
A word cunning means subtle or shrewd or crafty. That's how he rolls. He's very slick. He knows how to play the game. He is the ultimate scammer. Scamming is so big these days. Some of you are, you know, getting bites or they're baiting the carrot and putting it on your text message or on your social media or whatever it is, and they're trying to lure you in, pretending to be something innocent, and they're not. They're after, you know, your money or whatever it is. Well, Satan, he kind of does the same. He makes you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> he does not arrive with horns and a pitchfork. He transforms himself into an angel of light. You know, the serpent was not a scary creature. And more than likely, he was probably at this stage the most beautiful creature. There was something very appealing about him, very attractive. And notice that force is never used. The serpent simply suggests to Eve, you know, maybe God didn't say what you think he said. He causes her to question the very word of God. Notice how, how he, the serpent frames it. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now Eve, she did not hear from God directly. This command was relayed to her by her husband Adam. So the serpent is quite cunning here. You weren't there, Eve. You don't know what was said. And so this seed of doubt is being planted. Was her understanding correct? And this is how Satan maneuvers with us. He causes us to question the very word of God. Was that written for today? Is it applicable to our culture? And notice how Satan spins the truth. Did God really say you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? This is an attempt to make God look bad as if he's some super restrictive, you know, God that wants to deprive those who were created in his very image. And what God actually said was, if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, God says, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you will surely die. That's the proper context. We have all the freedom in the world, and yet there are forbidden things, and why are they forbidden? Because they rob us of freedom. They rob us of life. So God says, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat, but the serpent twists God's word. This is how cunning he is. He twists God's word to say, did God say you shall not eat of every tree? God saying you may freely eat of every tree. The serpent says, did God say you shall not eat of every tree? He sounds like cable news taking a statement and twisting it to make somebody, to discredit somebody. Well, Eve's first mistake, she should have stayed away from this tree in the first place. What was she doing there? She placed herself in temptation's way. In verses 2 and 3, it says, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So Eve starts out very well. She attempts to correct the serpent, set him straight. Now, God isn't the party pooper you're making him out to be. He's gracious. He said, we may eat of all the trees. It's just this one that we can't eat from. Eve so far, so good, you get props. But then she goes on to say this. God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it. Wait, what? Touch it? I, I don't remember that part. As a matter of fact, God never said, don't touch it. Now, it's likely that Adam told her that. See that fruit over there, honey? No touchy. Why? You'll die. 
Now, we do the same with our kids, right? The stove is hot. Don't touch it. And now they're even more curious. <laughs> I mean, you see a sign that says, don't touch. What's your first instinct? Our youngest daughter used to work at Heritage Boots in um, South Austin. Anybody ever go to Heritage Boots? Uh, cause, no, because you can't afford it. They start at like $800. They got all these beautiful custom-made cowboy boots. And um, there are signs on every shelf, everywhere. It looks, says, don't touch, don't touch, don't touch. You know what I want to do? What makes these boots so special? What, what is it about them that we're not supposed to touch? It's like, I'm going for, oh, there's a camera right there. But I mean, I, I want to touch. Listen, if you're painting the fence, the last thing you want to do is put up a sign that says, don't touch. You know, put up a sign that says wet paint. That, that's effective. You put up a sign, don't touch, you're inviting all kinds of fingerprints. It, it's likely that Adam told Eve, don't touch, but those were not God's exact words. And the serpent loves misquotes like that. Oh, this is someone who doesn't really know the word of God. And so he uses misquotes like that to his advantage. And this is why it's important, brother and sister, this is why it's important to know your Bibles. Goes on to say in verse 4 and verse 5, then the serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of that fruit, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. Don't you want that? You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, so he's really pulling at Eve here, very cunning. What are you talking about, woman? You, you're not going to die. It's not going to happen. It's a bluff. God is holding out on you. He's worried that you're going to be wise like him. And if you eat of that fruit, you will be. He's trying to frighten you off. Trust me, you're not going to die. You're going to be like God. A selling point with many cults even today. Most notably, the Mormons. The Mormons teach, and this is important to know because there's this idea out there that, you know, our God is the same God as the Mormons, and we essentially believe the same thing, and they're Christians just like us. Hey, my Bible doesn't say that God was once an ordinary man, but their God was. They teach that God was once an ordinary man, one of many, God lived on a planet called Kolob, and through good deeds, he worked his way up, and he was rewarded with his own universe to rule because he was so exceedingly good. And here's the thing, that we all have that same potential. This is what the Mormon church teaches, that you also have the potential. If you're good here on planet Earth, if you're good in the, a good Mormon, that you too will be given your own universe to rule and a bunch of wives to go with it. It's the original lie. It's the very one that Satan used to fool Eve. And cults today, not just the Mormons, but others, cults today have many people believing this lie. And this is another reason why it's so important to know God's word. I hope you're reading it. I hope you're meditating on it, studying it, taking time to understand it. Well, next comes the temptation in verse 6. So the hook has been baited. Now we got the temptation. It says in verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Notice how temptation happens. No force is involved. Notice that Satan did not put Eve in a headlock and cram the fruit down her mouth. He simply holds up the menu, special of the day, fresh fruit on that tree. 
He appeals to one's natural desires and the flesh does the rest. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 cuts to the heart of it. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. It is of the world. This is what causes us to sin. This is why we sin. The devil don't make us do it. Our flesh does. And Satan is keenly aware of this. So what does he do? He appeals to our natural inclinations, the lust of the flesh. Eve saw the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh. Then there's the lust of the eyes. She saw that it was pleasant to the eyes. Mm, looks good. And then there's the pride of life. Eve, Eve saw that the tree was desirable to make one wise. I want to be like God. And Satan, he tempted Jesus the same way. At a time when he was most vulnerable, Jesus was at the end of a 40-day fast. He's famished, dehydrated, exhausted, and Satan moves in and seizes the opportunity. And how does Jesus fend him off? With the word of God. And we fend him off the same way. But it's hard to resist sin when you're standing there drooling over it, which is what Eve did. Oh, the pleasure it will bring. Drool, drool. And make no mistake, sin is pleasurable. That's why we give into it. We wouldn't be tempted if it wasn't pleasurable. I mean, no one wants to do anything unpleasurable. And what makes it so tempting is sin is pleasurable. But we all know that its pleasure is only for a moment, whereas the consequences are lasting. Eve is not thinking about that. She's thinking the tree is good. Can it be wrong if it feels so right? Why would God deprive me of this? That isn't good. No, my desires are good. And then it happened. She took of the fruit and chomp, 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 gobble, gobble, gobble. We've all been there, haven't we? Temptation comes. We fantasize, we romanticize, we rationalize. What's the harm? Who am I hurting? It meets, it meets a need, not met at all. A law was passed making it legal. It's only natural. I was born this way. Hey, I was born in sin too. You need to be born again. And so we look, we linger we succumb. We partake of that fruit, whatever it is. No harm, no foul. So we say. Sometimes we're deceived. And yet other times we dive in eyes wide open. Isn't that what Adam did? The serpent never tempted him. Did you notice that? The ser serpent never tempted Adam. There was no need to. So Satan focuses on Eve. She reaches for the fruit, and Adam follows her lead. Apparently, the fruit was good to eat. Adam could see it on her face. I mean, she's just like, you know, beaming ear to ear. So whatever that fruit was, it, it was tasty. It, it wouldn't be right not to share. Here, honey, have a bite. Adam knew the consequences. He was told directly from God. It said that he ate out of empathy. He didn't want Eve to face the music alone. Such a martyr, that fella. <laughs> Taking the bullet for his beloved. I'm not really sure of that. What I am sure of is this. Sin is sin. No matter how noble the reason might be. If God says, don't do it, don't do it. Well, 
after the temptation and after the sin comes the shame, as we see in verse 7. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So the eyes of Adam and Eve are opened, and they see something never before seen. The evil of sin. And now they had a firsthand knowledge of it, both conceptually and experientially. They know what good is and how it brings joy, and they know now evil and how it brings shame. We can all attest to this, can't we? We sinned against somebody. And now we can't look them in the eye. We can't face them. We, we avoid them. We make a point of that. And we've all dodged God for the same reason, for this shame that we sinned against him. And we're so ashamed that we can't even come before him anymore. We can't even pray anymore because we feel so ashamed. And yet he's the only one who can take it away. But make no mistake about it, with sin comes shame, and with shame comes distance. And with distance comes heaviness. That's how David described it when his sin against Bathsheba went uh, unconfessed, or his sin with Bathsheba it went unconfessed. And he writes in the Psalm, Psalm 32, read the whole thing when you get a chance. I'll just quote from verses 3 and 4. Where David says, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. That's when his sin went unconfessed. And it just weighed on him so much. Relief finally came once David confessed. Now, he still had to live with the consequences. But even still, David became a man after God's own heart. That's the beautiful thing about God, that he can redeem anything. Yeah, there might still be consequences that linger, but he can redeem anything. And you too can be a man after God's own heart or a woman after God's own heart, no matter how bad you've blown it. Adam and Eve aren't there yet. They are riddled with shame. Chapter 2, the previous chapter, ends on this note. Chapter 2, verse 25. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. There was no need to be. But once sin enters the picture, things are seen in a different light, and we feel that need to cover up. And Adam and Eve do exactly that. They must have been in a big hurry because they grabbed whatever was within reach. And what do they grab for? Fig leaves. You ever felt a fig leaf? Oh, man. You don't ever want to cover up with those. They are very prickly and itchy. Uh, not the best thing. But that, that's man's attempt to cover up, right? Things get worse, not better. When you're trying to cover things up, things do not get better. They only get worse. Our attempts to cover sin are absolutely futile. There's only one who is able to cover sin. And notice that God provides a covering for Adam and Eve. Theirs is insufficient. And so God provides for them a covering, one that required the shedding of blood. And so it is with us. Blood was shed to cover our shame. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 reminds us without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. We acknowledge this with the Lord's Supper which we will do today in a few minutes. But when Jesus took the cup he said this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, for what? The remission of sins, Matthew 26, 28. 
This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. His blood is sufficient to cover every sin. He is faithful to remove all shame. And yet, consequences linger. And for this reason, we must flee from sin and never give Satan a foothold. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 reminds us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. By ourselves, with our own resources, we don't have a, a chance against the enemy. We must be strong in what? In the Lord, not strong in our own might, not strong in our own confidence, not strong in the latest self-help book we read, not strong in anything else, but strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not our own. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He seeks to take you down. He's like a roaring lion. Now, if you're like me, you're not always successful. You're not always suited up. You don't always have on the whole armor of God. And sometimes Satan finds those chinks in our armor. We all blow it. And yet we have this promise in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so that's the hope that I want to leave with you today. Because we've all stood where Adam and Eve stood in the face of temptation. And we've all had lapses of judgment where we gave in to that temptation. And oftentimes when we fall into that temptation, there's that tendency to avoid God. I'm unworthy to be in his presence. I'm ashamed of myself. And I don't even know how to pray or to face God in this hour or in this moment. And really, it's the only place you can go to have that burden lifted and to have that shame lifted and to have that sin lifted. He is the God of restoration. He is the God of second chances. He's a God who forgives. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and not only forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he will give you a new start today. If you are feeling distant from God this morning, if there's something that you have done that has brought shame upon yourself and it's caused you to be in this place where you're, you're feeling separated, distant from God, I want you to know that there's a way back and the way back is through Jesus Christ. And there's a faithful God that is waiting for you with open arms. Just as he did, you know, the father in that parable, the prodigal son, that parable was told so that we would understand the heart of our heavenly father. And the father greets his son with open arms. He returns from the pigsty and a lifestyle of sin. And the father is waiting for him and puts him on, the, you know, the robe on him and let's kill the fatted calf and let's party. My son has returned. And our God will do that for anybody. You just need to be willing to run to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we all know what it's like to be tempted. We all know what it's like to be weak. We all know what it's like to fall. We all know what it's like to sin. 
we are grateful for your forgiveness, for the provision that you made for us through Jesus Christ, who took all our sins, big and small, to the cross and shed his blood that they might be covered. And I pray for any here today, Lord, that are distant from you. They haven't been able to overcome that shame. And I pray that there would be brokenness here today, Lord. Contrition. Oh, Lord, that hearts would break right here, right now, in this room and online, Father. Oh, Lord, would there be hearts that are broken before you, Lord. Oh, Lord, that we would see our need for you. I pray, Lord, that the prodigals would return today. Lord, that you would heal the broken heart and that you would restore the hurting, that you would lift up those who have fallen. I, I pray that there would be repentance and brokenness and a returning to you. Touch hearts right now. And if you're one that feels distant from the Lord or maybe you've never made a commitment to him in the first place, I want to lead you in a prayer. Whether this is a first-time decision or you're just coming back after a slip or a fall. And I want to lead you in a prayer. Oh, Lord, you know my heart. And it has not been in the right place in recent days and I'm sorry I'm sorry that I've been distant from you I'm sorry that I have allowed my shame to keep me from you I'm sorry for what sin has done in my life and in my heart and so Lord I'm now coming to the altar I'm just laying everything out there Father God it's all yours I'm not worthy to come to you, but I have no other place to go. And so, Lord, I, I, I just say, here, here am I. Today, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I give you my allegiance. I turn away from that thing that took me away from you, and I turn back to you. You are my Lord. You are my God. I acknowledge Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I acknowledge that he stepped down from heaven to earth. He walked among men. I acknowledge that Jesus went to the cross and shed blood for the sins of the world, including mine. I acknowledge that Jesus died and was buried. And I acknowledge that on the third day he rose again and appeared to many. I further acknowledge that he ascended into heaven. He's at the right-hand side of the Father. And I believe that he's coming back, and I want to be ready for that day. So, Lord, I'm yours. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. In Jesus' name.